Humphrey Lee Pierce. Onlangs overleed deze zanger op 37-jarige leeftijd. Zeven jaar geleden werd hij geportretteerd na een concert in Paradiso. Jeffrey Tears. Begin jaren 80 aanvoerder van de Gunclub. Sleutelband van de Amerikaanse gitaarscene. Minstens één variant OP, de Las Vegas Story uit 1984. Daarna solo, minder succesvol en enigszins een lage wal. Maar sinds kort weer van de drank af. I'm just going to flash now because it's too dark. specifically about uh, Blondie. I liked uh, surf songs and things like that. And uh, that cheesy American pop, you know, that sort of um, I fought the law, but the law won type songs. Bobby Fuller type songs. And because I, I heard all that music when I was young, when I was a kid, but I guess I was too young, you know, in the, in the 60s to really think about who it was or what it was, you know. So it sort of like rediscovered it that way. I was here for some business meetings and things like this because I'm trying to find a European deal and um, ran into these guys from this television station. Jeffrey used to come to our hotel room and he used to, he used to sort of run this fan club for Blondie in the early days and we used to have to throw him out of the hotel room. I didn't know he would go. <laughs> Why did you have to throw him out? Well, because he wouldn't leave. <laughs> he would just sit there. He would just sit there. No, oh, that's All what right. I was referring to. <laughs> Jeffrey had did not have any career at that time and was just though, like, hey, you know, Ronnie. floating Sorry, teenager yeah. wondering what to do in life. And, and he figured out how to do music and uh, it's been an uphill battle ever since. I used to stay around all the time, yeah. My parents are getting divorced and I couldn't go home. <laughs> they're, they're fighting. <laughs> try them you know and usually I never can remember exactly how they're done but sometimes I, have, I can get a good idea that way too I, some, I'll just distort what I think they sound like <laughs> Like I used to always just whenever I made up something, I used to just you know go 
hawk it on the Texan horse that's, you know. <laughs> like, um, oh, we're gonna play Ain't That Peculiar like this, you know. I figured out Smokey Robinson songs were kind of closet blue songs too. So we just changed it to like straight off Delta Holland Wolf song. <laughs> you know, she changed it to Holland Wolf. Ain't that peculiar? <laughs> Phil Alvin and the Blasters got me hooked on it, and, then, uh, and Bob Height, Late of Canned Heat. Bob Height, like, you know, had us over the house a few times and just showed us incredibly wonderful records that just simply were not available or in print, and there was no way to obtain them. And, and um, you know, he just sort of created, like, the whole fascination with finding, finding a, undiscovered products. It's like archaeology in a way, I guess. We would buy stuff strictly only on the basis of the title. It looked like it might be a blues record. <laughs> Don Waller, who wrote a book about Motown, was a real close friend of mine. A big influence at the start of the band, getting us into the whole darkness surrounding Robert Johnson and all these things. All these things that sounds pretty exciting to a bunch of young musicians. <laughs> Bob Height used to tell me about, like, oh, yeah, we took a trip. Oh, we took a trip to Alabama. And he goes, and we found, um, oh, what was it? Yeah, we took a trip to Alabama. We found an old record distribution warehouse that I'd read about, you know, which used to put out a lot of Ace and Sun and records of this sort. We thought we'd have a look in there. He goes, and they go through this old warehouse, and the records are all still in there. It's just this warehouse. No one's ever cleaned it out. No one wants to clean out a bunch of 78s. It's heavy. You know, so no, still no one's ever done it. So he says, he goes, and it was just like mountains. We had to like crawl over the records. And he's going, no, I had to, because I had to get to those blues sites because I was looking for Rube Lacey, Hamhound Crave. <laughs> you know, he's telling us all this. And he goes, it was way in the back of the place. I was sure. He goes, he's digging through it. And I was going, and he's going, I was going, well, what else is there, B? What else did you see? He goes, oh, well, there's a lot of Sun Records. He says, because I wasn't even paying attention to Sun Records, man. We just break that stuff when we're walking across to try to get to the blues records. <laughs>
like uh, from a musical point of view on your own career from the last 10 years? Uh, I don't know, I'm still sort of, I'm still pretty dissatisfied with it. Um, I think I'm just too young. What, you know, when I started or something, I just, there's a lot of things I did now I wouldn't do in retrospect. Where are you from, Patricia? Los Angeles. And how long have you been with the band? With Gun Club, about a year. And I knew Jeffrey before that. And uh, I knew the other members that were in the band in the past, and that's how I got in it. Uh, Patricia, what could you say about the musical concept of the Gun Club? As far as I know, there isn't one. It just it keeps changing. I've been in it, you know, with the other two members, and it was completely different. Um, this is getting, it's getting wackier and wackier. It's getting, I don't know, when it, somebody asks what this is like, I can't well, answer. That all ended, though, quite a while ago. Yeah. Uh, at least as far as I know, it did. <laughs> uh, you know, and then after that, you know, we thought we were behaving really well by just being alcoholics, but then we actually had found out we had to stop that, too. Somebody's in my home. This band plays, plays is, is so nice. Yeah, they have like a really strange timing. Yeah. Because all those songs are such really out there songs. He's, he's, you can't defend that. Like post war blues, he's like my favorite guy. I mean, he's the one who's most completely out. I mean, he's somewhat way out in some weird deep jungle or something. <laughs> Everybody else like seems to be like aware of what's going on, you know, just sort of slickness, professionalism, a lot of like Chicago stuff. Well, Holland Wolf is still way back in the woods. So yeah, doesn't even, you know. He's dying all the time in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> like fucking hell, what's happening here? <laughs> 
Don't you think that that whole uh, drug and alcohol thing also had a very bad influence on, on your creative career, don't you think? Sure. There's a lot of decisions you made that were just absolutely idiotic. They were under the, under the influence of another influence. Mm -hmm. That stuff influences everything. It influences your decisions, your behavior, the way you walk, your relationships. Not just the way people perceive you. It influences everything. You can't be really creative. Then you, then, you, then you think 30 minutes of, you know, a horrible version of a Love Supreme played on guitar is really great. <laughs> you know, I listen to it now, I go, ah! <laughs> what was I doing? I'm going down the river of sadness. I'm going down the river of pain. Voices that speak nothing, speak nothing to you. 